Does anyone else hear that cricket? Huh. I find that irrationally annoying. I'll get over it. In the fall of 2009, you may remember that there was a series of unexplained accelerations that happened in, in Toyotas. It was a really big scare. At one point, um, the Attorney General of the United States got on TV and told everyone, if you're driving a Toyota, take it to the dealer right away because they have a fix for this. And there's all this sort of latent paranoia floating around that people's cars were taking off and outside of their control, and it was just a scary time. There's this sense that Toyota was pulling a fast one. There was some sort of conspiracy, some sort of cover-up, accusations of putting profits ahead of safety. It led to the recall of 10 million cars, a $1.1 billion fine levied by the United States government against Toyota, and a $1.2 billion class action lawsuit, not to even mention all the, there were about 400 other legal actions that happened around this event. As you may remember, there were two different sort of stories that tried to explain what was happening with, with these uh, cars that were taking off unexplained accelerations. The first story goes like this. Up till 2000, there was a mechanical linkage if you pushed the gas down, that pushed something that was connected to the throttle, right? Mechanical linkage. You push here, it moves there, your gas opens up, you go faster. As of 2003, that was replaced, 2003 onwards, replaced by a computer. You're no longer pushing a throttle, you're, you're hitting the space bar, right? You're, you're, you're pressing on something that's registering on a computer. And it, you know computers, they have millions of lines of code. So somewhere in the code, there was a ghost in the machine, a flaw, something happening, so that you thought you were pushing it down and it was a, a, some programming error that cars were taking off out, out, without control, right? This was the line of argument that was used in the class action lawsuit. And so the other version of what was happening was a concern about the floor mats. These really thick rubber winter floor mats were sliding forward and catching the, so that when the pedal was down, it was catching the, pe the pedal such that the pedal would be stuck down and you'd take off until you hit something, right? And so it was the floor, it was either the computer or the floor mats, right? Two stories, two versions of events, and they both assume that the car is the problem. And the advice given is, if you find yourself in an unintended acceleration, you push down on the, on the, on the brake as hard as you can and you don't let go. All right? You don't let go. That's what Consumer Reports, other people were giving this advice. That's the story. Let's look at that story a bit closer. Let's start with the floor mat. Right? Let's, let's start with the floor mat. What does it take for a floor mat to catch a pedal? Right? If the floor mat is forward, the pedal has to be so far down that when it comes back, it hits the, it hits the floor mat, right? How many of you floor your gas on a regular basis? When's the last time you floored it? Right? You all might have heavier feet than I, but you know, I can't think of the last time I, I floored it. Right? So, hmm, imagine this. You're driving down the highway and the cruise control is on, and someone jumps in front of you. Right? What do you do? you hit the brake, right? And, and what happens is, if, if your car doesn't slow down, you're, 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 you are now in an unintended acceleration event, what do you do? You're pushing the brake, so you push harder. And you push the pedal down until it, it catches, right? Except which pedal were you pushing? What I'm suggesting is that the problem is not the car, but the person driving the car. If you mistake the gas for the brake, right? How many times have you shoved your brake all the way down to the floor? Right? That happens. You, you do that far more often. And if you, shove the, if you shove a pedal all the way down to the floor and you hit the, the gas instead of the brake, well, then the gas would come back and hit the, 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 the floor mat. And then you would have an unintended acceleration. It's, it, it, the problem is what, what the person did, not, not with the car. Right? Because you see what happens is if you hit the brakes, I promise you something, brakes win. Brakes win. If you push the brakes down, your car is gonna stop. Car and Auto and Edmonds uh, both tested this. They, they took out, uh, independently, they took out a Camry 
and they would put down the gas, they'd get up to 75 mi or 65 miles per hour, and um, holding the gas down, they would then depress the brake. And with the, with the throttle open, going 65 miles per hour, you know what happens when you slam on the brakes? You stop, right? The Camry brakes are actually so good that it stops in the same distance with the throttle open as a Taurus does if you just take your foot off the, off the gas and put the, your foot on the brake, right? Camry brakes are really impressive, actually. So, and you can, you can test this if, if you really want to, right? What, what would you do? Go out to the parking lot, turn on your car, put it in gear, shove the brake all the way down, and then hit the, with your left foot, then hit, your, hit the gas with your right foot. You know what's gonna happen? Nothing. Nothing at all. You're going to stay right there. Right? It's not about the floor mats. It's just brakes. Right? What, what were you actually pushing? Only a small percentage of Toyotas actually had those thick floor mats. So what was happening with the other uh, cars, the other incidents? Right? The, the, other thing, the other story that was being told was about computer programming. And both NASA and the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration uh, did reports on, on they took out the, the boxes, the computers uh, that were running the cars from these cars that had these events. And, and they looked at all the coding, and, and I read the reports on, on their analysis of the code, and it took some coffee. They were dry, dry reports. Here's the most crucial sentence. They found no evidence that a malfunction in electronics caused large unintended accelerations. They came to this conclusion after reviewing all the code. And the funny thing about having a computer is that it's a black box. You hear about when uh, airplanes go down, they check the black box for what happened. Cars have those now too. Since 2003, when they went to the, the, the electronic control of the throttle, you've got a computer. It's recording everything that happens. And so they analyzed the computers, the black boxes of these cars where there had been unintended accelerations. And you know what they found? No one had ever hit the brakes. This, they would tell the story that they'd push the brake down as hard as they could. They'd push the brake down as hard as they could. That's the story they're telling. But when you check the computer, the, what the computer actually registered was, was that the gas was all the way down. And maybe the floor mat caught it at that point, but they weren't hitting the brake. They were hitting the gas. They just didn't realize it. Well, so what's happening here? Let me propose a different story than your car is out to get you. All right? Richard Schmidt is a fellow who did uh, the, the research on the 1980 Audi 500 unintended acceleration challenge and scare. Uh, now, I don't see a lot of Audis driving around northern Missouri, so you might have forgotten this, but in 1980, there was a scare around Audis taking off, unintended accelerations. And, and so, in 1980, right, long before electronic control of throttle, and, and so this fellow Richard Schmitz doing this research, and he kept on looking into this, this trend. He looked at 150 individual events between 1980 and 2000 of unintended acceleration. And he, what, th these events happened, oh, thank you, in cars, trucks, buses, golf carts, right? He, he looked at all of these. And, and it didn't matter the make, the model, there, there was no trend there. It happened on vehicles with and without floor mats, cheap cars, expensive cars, cars with crews, cars without crews, carbureted, fuel injected, diesel, didn't matter. It happened in all of these cars. And the theme that showed up, here are the most common factors when it comes to unintended acceleration events. Older drivers, unfamiliar with the car, driving for the first or second time, right after they get in the car, who are shorter. Right? That's the permutation of factors. If you have two or three of those, that's what's showing up in these unintended acceleration events. And, and so think about what this means. You get in a car, and it's not a car you're familiar with. Who here shares a car with someone who's a different height? Right? You know what it's like, I get in the car after Olivia, I get in, in our Camry, and, and every time there's all the fiddling and the mirror and the mirror and the steering wheel and the seat, and you have to get everything adjusted properly, and it takes a while, right? And do you ever get it adjusted exactly how you want it? 
Of course not. Right? You got you get a halfway to Green City and you're still fiddling with everything. Right? So you get into a car that you're not familiar with. You're fiddling with it. Maybe there's a floor mat so you're a little bit different way, place where your foot hits the gas pedal. And, and so you, you're fiddling with all of this and you take off to drive and, and, and you have to stop quickly and, and, and then you hit the brakes. You think you hit the brakes. You intended to hit the brakes, but you didn't hit the brakes because everything's a little bit off, a little bit cattywampus, right? You hit the gas and you get scared. So you push the gas down further, you think you're braking, and then you hit something. That's what happens, right? You think, you, and you think, how can that happen, right? How can it happen that something I've done again and again and again and again and again, how many times have you hit the brakes, right? It's, it's a no, rather large number, right? But how many times does a, ba base, a, ba a basketball player shoot a free throw? Again and again, exact same thing. They do it thousands of times, right? Do they hit it every time? No, because what you tell your body to do and what your body does, it's not, it doesn't always work perfectly. Not every single time. Even Tiger Woods didn't always hit it straight, right? Sometimes your body just doesn't do exactly what you want it to. You thought you were hitting the brake and you didn't. That's what the National Highway, in, Highway Transport Safety Board found, NHTSB. That's what NASA found. And for good measure, that's what both Japan and Canada found when they study the exact same occurrences. But wait, why did it happen so often with Camrys? Well, Camrys were the, most, the highest selling car in that, that time frame. And so it's not that Camrys were, were more prone to it, it's that there were a lot more Camrys on the road. So it would show up more often in Camrys. So, a better assumption, a better story. It's not that the car is taking off on its own. It's not that your car is out to get you. The better assumption is that the car is a tool and it does exactly what you tell it to. And in an unfamiliar situation, we are more likely to make a mistake and not realize it. And so we think we're braking and we're not. Right? And if we know that the brakes always win and we think we're braking and we're not, what should we do? What's the better response? Should we do what we're already doing, keep on shoving on the brake? No. If you think you're hitting the brake and you're still speeding up, stop what you're doing, take your foot off whatever pedal it's on, then make darn sure that you hit the brake. And then you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna stop, right? A better assumption leads to a better story, and it's a matter of life and death in this case, right? If you find yourself driving down the road and you're taking off, take your foot off and then hit the brake correctly, right? It's a, a bad story can lead to, to tragedy, right? I drive a Camry every day. I drive a Toyota and I trust it. I trust it to do exactly what I tell it to do. I just don't trust myself to always do exactly what I meant to do, right? It works out. I, I know I'm not, I'm not perfect. It works out better. If you want to hear more about this, there's a podcast on this by Malcolm Gladwell. This is the, the short version, uh, but it's a better, telling a better story. The same thing is happening in Corinth. The people of Corinth are telling a story about what it means to follow Jesus. Right? They're telling a story, and Paul is responding to them story and saying, no, there's a better story to tell. Right? Here's the story that the people, some of the people in Corinth are telling. The story goes like this. They follow Jesus now. And because they follow Jesus, they know that there is only one God, and all these bits of stone and wooden statues, all these idols, they're not real. right? They know that they're not real. There's no such thing as all of these other gods. They know because they know the one true God. And because they know this, they know that they are free to do as they want. When it comes to what they eat, whether it is sacrificed at a temple or not, when it comes to going to other temples, when it comes goes to going to other parties or, or worships or whatever, they can go because it's not real. Right? All those other idols, they're not real. And they need to hold on to this freedom for it is essential to following Jesus that they are not bound by the law. And anyone who tries to tell them otherwise, who tries to restrict their freedom, that they need to be anything other than fully free, obviously doesn't get Jesus. In their radical commitment to being free, they are the ones who really understand Jesus. Right? Their assumption... They are freed from the superstitious commitment to mere pieces of stone or wood because they follow Jesus. And so their response 
is to enjoy all there is to enjoy. And anyone who questions doesn't get it and doesn't understand what it really means to follow Jesus. And it's so important that they are clear about what it means to follow Jesus. They, they are committed to this. They hold the line on this so that everyone else might know the truth. If you follow Jesus, you are free. Peter, Paul writes to them and tells them a better story. He tells them a different story. In this last chapter talking about uh, having a stake, Paul says, focuses on, on, on the old stories. He says, remember our forefathers who passed through the waters fleeing Egypt. They ate what God provided. Right? Paul is connecting these folks to our fathers. That's the phrase he's using, to our forefathers, to the people who God has blessed before. And this is not an obvious connection. If you go up to a first century Gentile in Corinth and you ask them, who are your forefathers? I guarantee you they're not going to say those Jews from about a, 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 a millennia ago. Right? That's not what's going to come off their tongues. They are Gentiles of Roman and Italian and, and descent of a very mixed lineage. Right? And, and Paul is looking at them and saying, our forefathers... Who? What do we have to do with Jacob and Isaac and Moses and all of those folks who have come before us? But Paul says to them, no, those are our fathers, for they are the ones who set up for Jesus, and we follow Jesus, and so they are our fathers. And if you look at them, you're going to see your, yourselves in their story, because Paul points out to them, Remember how they walked through the, the, the Red Sea? They walked through the Red Sea and then they ate manna in the, in the desert there, right? They are blessed through God using water and food. In the same way that you have been blessed, you have been baptized into the body of Christ and brought forward to communion, right? To, to be fed here. Just the same way that God blessed them with water and food, God is blessing you with water and food. And, and look back at them and you'll see how they, God loves them, but then they go astray. They use the, the freedom that they now have. They have been freed from bondage and slavery in Egypt and they've been, they are coming into the wilderness on their way to their promised land. And yes, God blesses them. Yes, they are known by God, but they use their newfound freedom in ways that are unhealthy. And it leads to many, many of them dying. They use their freedom in ways that are destructive. And one of the ways they misuse this freedom involves idolatry. Yes, we, they knew back then the same thing we know today, that they really were just bits of wood and stone. Yet when you gather, you gather around something that is more than what you can touch. Right? When we gather around the communion table, we gather, and, and more is happening here than what you can see and what you can touch. It is, it is creating church. Right? When you, get, you hear the word proclaimed, and then you gather around Jesus Christ's table, that, that's church. That's the simplest definition. That's what makes church. The word of God, and then you come to Jesus' table. You have now churched. Right? And so if you go to another place, which is gathered around, not around Jesus, but about around bits of stone and about around other things, it's like an anti-church. It's like anti-communion. You're gathering around these other idols, and it's demonic because it is creating something that is against God and God's desires. And you're tempted to do this, right? You're tempted. Paul points this out. You're tempted. You're facing the same temptation they, our forefathers faced long ago, but you need to flee from it. Right? You, are, you will not face a temptation that is not common to all, and you need to flee from it. Flee from it because you can't handle it, you can't play with it, you can't dance with it, you can't pretend it's not a big deal. Right? Flee from temptation. Flee towards Christ and Christ's table. That's the better story that Paul wants them to hear. Paul's assumption is different because he says, yes, we are free, but freedom can be used poorly. And we have examples of that in the Old Testament when our forefathers messed it up. Let's learn their lessons. Not so that we can start making, uh, making another set of laws. We don't need another set of laws, but we need to look at how they did it and be informed so we don't follow down that same path. Right? There's a big difference between the story that the, the Christians at Corinth are telling, that we are free, we can do whatever we want, so get off our backs, and what Paul tells. The story Paul tells is we are free, so let us use that freedom in an informed fashion. Flee from temptation, or else we will suffer the consequences that our forefathers did. All right? The better story leads to the better response. Don't assume the car is out to get you. Assume that you're not perfect. And so when you think you're pushing the brake and it's still speeding up, stop, make sure you really are pushing the brake, and save your life. 
Don't assume that you are freed for your own sake so that now you can do whatever you want. Instead, assume that your freedom is for the glory of God and is for service to others. Or else you might lose your way in life like those who, lo who were lost and died in the wilderness on the way to the promised land. A better story is not just a, a matter of a better life. It's a matter of life and death itself. Paul wraps up this entire discussion summarizing, saying, first, let all of our actions glorify God, and this includes service to others. Right? And as long as that's true, then you are free to do whatever brings you joy and peace and satisfaction. But the first thing's got to be true. You, as long as all of your actions are glorifying God, you are free to do whatever you want within those bounds. But if your actions are not all glorifying God, then stop it. Right? Just stop it. Christian freedom is wonderful as long as it is used in the context of glorifying God and serving others. I, I think this might be the, the thing we need to hear today because, uh, you know, I'm not worried about whether we eat a steak or not. As I said, I, I prefer my steak medium rare and I consider uh, steak a great gift to us. Um, I don't think there's any fight about whether we should read the Old Testament, whether they are, they are our forefathers. They are, right? We learn from them. But it's this bit about freedom, about restrictions on our freedom that begins to sting. Because I think that we end up being as vehement in our defense of our freedom as the church was in Corinth, right? That, that sort of vehement, it's I, my way, I can do my way, I'm free, don't touch me, back off, my decision, my way, right? I think our freedom can in some ways become an idol, something that we worship, something we insist upon. And to hear Paul say, yes, we are free, but we are free for a purpose, right? Our freedom is that we get to choose who we will serve. We either serve ourselves Right? Or we serve something greater than ourselves. And you know what happens if you serve yourself all, all your life long? It's not pretty, is it? If you always give yourself exactly what you want all the time, you're just feeding yourself and yourself not big enough. Right? Your dreams, your goals are not big enough. We are freed for a purpose. And I think the word, I, I stumbled up all around this trying to figure out how to explain what this looks like. And, and then we sang that hymn this morning that over in Green City. We sang it first, Blessed Assurance. And, and this gets it. This just nails it. Right? This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Right? That's what Paul writes first. This is our story, praising our Savior all the day long and all that we do. And then we get into the verses, and what does he write? Perfect submission, perfect delight. Perfect submission, all is at rest. Right? Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending. Right? This is what, how we want to live. We want to live with delight and rest. And we find it not when we insist upon that our freedom is for us and only for us, but when we take the freedom we are given and submit it and say, to God be the glory. I will use my freedom to serve God's dreams and God's purposes. That's when we find perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior and happy and blessed. Right? Filled with his goodness and lost in his love. That's the desire I have. Uh, th th re reading these chapters of Paul have left me uh, pondering, am I a little bit too precious, a little bit too uh, guarded about my freedom? Right? You ask, if people ask of us, people wonder whether we can do something. Am I a little bit too uh, protective of my freedom, or do I need to contemplate how my freedom really is not freedom for me, it is freedom for God and for others? I pray that my freedom is indeed used for God and for others, and I pray that all of us might be able to ponder this and be able to stay the sa say the same. Amen. We've come to a time when we uh, confess our faith.